want to come straight to our lesson tonight. I don't want to take away from the Job reading that our brothers are doing. And so we'll come straight to uh, our, our scripture lesson. I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We'll look at several verses together. But I want to begin a new study with you uh, this evening. As I was looking over it again this afternoon, it's remarkable how well it coincides with our Sunday school class this morning. I didn't plan this, but the Lord certainly did. It's amazing the overlap when we think about things of earth and our finding our joy not in the things of earth, but in the things of God. I want to talk to you about and do a little study on earthly mindedness, and then we'll roll over from that unto what it means to be heavenly minded, or as Paul says in our passage, to, be, to have our conversation or our conduct in heaven. And then ultimately, hopefully thirdly, we'll do a lesson on what it means to be those who walk with God, thinking particularly of Enoch whom we also reference this morning in the sermon. Why is earthly mindedness important to think about, or to talk about, or to study? As I reflect upon scripture and my own study and reading of it, and I'm sure you can think the same in your own interaction with God's word, it is noteworthy, I think, throughout scripture that most of the disciplining judgments of God are actually poured out on his people uh, in response to their worldliness or their earthly mindedness. We find in scripture that God's people are guilty of gross sin, yes, but most often it's not that. And if it ever winds up in gross sin, it begins, as we heard this morning, in walking in the way of the counsels of the ungodly and etc., in the progression of sin, it begins with earthly mindedness, it begins with worldliness. And the trouble with worldliness is it's not something that's just outside of us, the world. We have been separated unto God, but the problem is the world still lives in our hearts. The world dwells mostly in us, and that's what we get ensnared by. But Scripture is filled with examples when what we find in the, in the Holy Scripture is when God's people lose sight of their having been separated from the world and unto God and given a citizenship in heaven. Jesus speaks, remember in John 17, I pray not for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they were yours, you gave them to me, and I have called them unto myself. And Jesus prays as well in that passage, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, because we need to be a light and a witness in the world, but protect them from the evil one in the world, protect them from the snares and the temptations uh, that necessarily come with living in the world. But when God's people lose sight of having been separated from the world and given a citizenship in heaven, and we begin to walk and talk like those who are bound to the earth, and as if we were made for the earth, and this is all there is, and we want to take as much as we can of life, when God's people fall into places like that, the Lord usually intervenes with awakening hardships, with trials that have a way, like nothing else, of reminding us that this world is not our home. We fall into the trap so easily of seeking our end in this world and not realizing that we are just passers, passers through, that we are here, as the Puritans used to say, but for a night. Tomorrow we will wake up and be in glory. The Lord needs to remind us that this is not our home. He needs to remind us that our citizenship is in heaven, where we, as Paul says in Colossians 3, are already seated with Christ. In Ephesians 2, Colossians 3, Paul says the same thing. He says we were raised up with Christ and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. It's a remarkable image, but a very true image as we are united to Christ. He is, as Paul says in Colossians 3, he is our life. And one of the problems with earthly mindedness is it's so hard to see. It's very subtle. It's very hard to recognize. And one of the greatest dangers of earthly mindedness is that it's very destructive to a life that is seeking to live to the glory of God and in the joy of God, as we heard from our catechism this morning. So it will do us good, I think, to study three things together. Number one, what is the nature of earthly mindedness? And why is earthly mindedness so dangerous to God's people? And secondly, what's the great difference between being earthly minded and having our conversation and our citizenship in heaven? And then thirdly, what does it look like to really walk with God? Enoch is such a remarkable example. He blows our mind. He walked with God and God took him. He was not. God took him. You well know, as I do, that Enoch did not die. He was merely translated into glory. And we're told the reason was is because he walked with God. We can only fill in the blanks of what that fellowship and that communion with God must have been like for Enoch. 
with the Lord for 365 years. Absolutely remarkable. But whatever it was, it was such that he was a heavenly-minded man, a man who lived in heaven on earth, and a man who was taken by God to show us the blessedness of true fellowship and communion with God. And that we can have that fellowship, we can have that communion even here. As one of the Puritans pointed out, it's remarkable that Enoch was said to have walked with God when he was married to a sinner and no doubt had sinful children. You can walk with God in marriage. You can walk with God as a parent of children who often break your heart. You can walk with God in the normal course of life. You don't need to be a monk and separate from all of the normal things of life in order to walk with God. You can walk with God right where you are. So that's where we'll end our study. Look at Philippians 3. Here's the passage I want to begin with, and we'll look at several tonight. But this will be our foundational passage. Paul begins in verse 17. He said, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, walking in God. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice verse 19 now. Their, destru- their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, here it is, with minds set on earthly things. Now look at the contrast in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's a passage in which, in the middle of this wonderful epistle of joy, in fact, <coughs> the apostle urges his readers to imitate him and all those who walk with God in holy conversation and conduct because their citizenship is in heaven. Because their citizenship is in heaven, they walk with God throughout life with a holy, a heavenly conversation. And so he encourages his readers to imitate him and those and not to follow after the pattern of those whom he calls enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, why are they enemies of the cross of Christ? He tells us, Because their God is their belly, they glory in their shame, they have minds set on earthly things. It's that last phrase that we're focusing on. Put these two things together. Paul says, don't follow after the pattern of those who are enemies of Christ. Well, what does their life look like? How do you know them when you see them, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ? Their minds are set on earthly things. Paul says something similar, as you know, in Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 5, he says, those who set their mind... Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So just bring these two passages together. It shows us that the great importance of setting our minds on something because it necessarily translates into how we live and behave. Think about that for a moment. Paul is telling us that what we set our mind on necessarily translates into how we live. Isn't this why he tells us in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set your mind on these things. And notice the next verse, verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So our conduct is directly related to what we think about. That's why Paul warns against following after men and imitating men whose mind is set on earthly things because earthly mindedness inevitably translates into earthly living. So we're told here in Philippians 4, 8, set your mind on things above. Colossians 3, 1, set your affections and the heart and mind are so intimately intertwined. Set your heart on things above. Romans 12, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind that you may discern what is the good and perfect will of God. You can see the relationship here. Earthly mindedness inevitably translates into earthly living. And when this happens among the people of God, what does God do? God sends a wake-up call, maybe a rebuke, a correction, and if necessary, an afflicting providence. You remember what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 23 to Peter. You can turn there if you like. (coughs) Matthew 16, 23, and Peter says to the Lord, you shall not go to the cross. You know the context. He corrects the Lord, rebukes the Lord. 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. And notice why. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's conduct in that situation where Christ told his disciples that he was to suffer and die. Peter's conduct had been determined by him setting his mind on the things of man. If he would have set his mind on the things of God, as Christ was doing, and knew this was necessary for him, necessary to secure the salvation of his people, then Peter's response would have been differently. So Peter's reaction to Christ was the, was the result of him setting his mind, says Jesus, on the things of man, the things of earth. Thinking like an earthbound, if you will, an earthbound creature, and not a heavenbound creature. Turn to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah 18, and then we'll turn to Hosea 13. Jeremiah 18, and then actually Jeremiah 44, and then Hosea 13. So Peter set his mind on the things of man, the things of earth, and what did Christ do? He rebuked him. Notice what happens here in Jeremiah 18, verses 11 and 17. Or 11 to 17, sorry. Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they say, that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and every, will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Ask among the nations, who has heard the like of this? The virgin Israel has done a very horrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of Syrian? Do the mountain waters run dry, the cold flowing streams? But my people have forgotten me. They, have, they make offerings to false gods. They made them stumble in their ways, in the ancient roads, and to walk into side roads, not the highway, making their land a horror, a thing to be hissed at forever. Everyone who passes by it is horrified and shakes his head. Like the east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy. I will show them my back and not my face in the day of their calamity. God's going to send them a wake-up call. Why? Because they have forgotten me. How could they forget God? They can't literally forget God. But they've taken their mind and set it on things of earth. On the things of idolatry, the things of man, the things of their own stubborn hearts. They've taken their mind off of the things of God and set it on the things of earth. And therefore the Lord says, this is a horrible thing. They have forgotten me. And I will turn my back to them. God's going to send them a wake-up call. Turn to Jeremiah 44, verse 28. At the end of a long passage, very similar to what we just read, God's judgment on Israel for their idolatry, their earthly mindedness. Verse 28. And those who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number. And all the remnant of Judah who came to the land of Egypt to live shall know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. God is going to send an afflicting providence to his people. He says he's going to take them into Egypt and they're going to die there. And then he says at the last, I will bring back a remnant. And the remnant will come to see that it is not their word, what we just read. I'm going to follow, every man's going to follow the stubborn evil, the stubborn evil of his own heart. No. I will show you whose word will stand, mine or yours. And it's the Lord's. So God will bring them back after an afflicting providence, a wake-up call to see that they cannot pursue the things of earth, but they must pursue the things of God. Turn now to Hosea 13. Verses 4 to 8. Hosea 13, 4 to 8. But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, God brought them into the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled, and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. 
God is going to come to his people with an afflicting providence. Why? They are his people. Because they have forgotten him. I was the God who knew you in Egypt. I was the God who delivered you from Egypt. I was the God who brought you through the wilderness. I was the God who gave you, gave you a land of plenty. But when you became full, you set your mind on things of the earth. And you took your mind off of me. So I will come with a wake-up call and bring you back. At great cost to ourselves. But as we heard this morning, God will get his glory on his creatures. And he will get his glory on his church and in his church by his grace. So what we see then is there's a great difference between a wicked man and a godly man. Paul says that a wicked man minds the things of the earth. And a godly man behaves as a citizen of heaven because he minds the, minds the things of heaven. Notice in Philippians 3 verse 20, he talks about our citizenship is in heaven. He skips the minding part. He goes right to the end. But the reason our citizenship is in heaven, because God, is God, the God of grace, has made it so, but therefore we mind the things of heaven. And that turns into and gives fruit to a walk with God. So we see there is an earthly mindedness that is sinful. It's a mindedness that is a, that is a turning away from the minding of God, a forgetting of God, and minding the earth in a way that brings God's chastisement upon us, God's discipline upon us, and brings us into great and many hardships. So what does this look like? When do we mind earthly things in a sinful way? Not every minding of the earth is sinful. We saw that this morning when we talked about subordinate ends, right? We can have our chief end, but then there are subordinate ends to which we're all accountable by God, right? Before God, we're accountable to seek, and to, to seek these things and to be diligent about these things. We're accountable to tend to things of the earth and to live on the earth and provide for ourselves and our families, provide for the church. So what is that earthly mindedness then that is sinful and that makes a man an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, we can describe it in several ways. First of all, when we look upon the things of the earth as the greatest of things, as the things, turn to Matthew 6, another well-known passage. <clears throat> Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we are not to mind the things of the earth in a way that shows that these are our treasures. So what is an earthly mindedness? What does it look like when it's sinful? It looks like this. When we count the things of the earth to be our treasure, our greatest possession, God gives his people the blessings of the earth. You think of, you think of Isaac's blessing to Jacob in Genesis 27. And the blessing that was given to Jacob was right, the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven. Right? It was the dew of heaven was first, noticeably, but the fatness of the earth as well. God blesses his people with the things of the earth. But for those who mind heavenly things <clears throat> as their best things, they're not tied to the earthly things as if their happiness was bound up in them. You think what we read this morning from Psalm 73 with Asaph. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Right? There's a lot of things we like and a lot of things that we enjoy and things we want on earth, things that we pursue and seek after and strive to gain and have and enjoy. That's fine. But ultimately, if that were all taken away, we would still be okay. A heavenly minded man. You remember the instance in 2 Samuel 19 after David returned and the instance with Mephibosheth and how Ziba had misrepresented him at first and then when Mephibosheth came back and, and met David, you remember David told Mephibosheth and Ziba that half goes to, to Mephibosheth and they will divide everything. What was Mephibosheth's response? Let him take it all. I don't care about any of this because you to see you is, is to see the face of God, to sit at your table, that is enough for me, right? Now, Mephibosheth was, of course, Saul's descendant, and he had a right to, to half of the possessions and this great inheritance and all these things. But 
And those are wonderful things and certainly nice things to have and enjoy and necessary things, a living and a, and a home and a field and a farm and cattle. And all that. But what did all that matter to Mephibosheth? Not a bit in comparison to enjoying the favor of David and the table of David, the fellowship of David. That was what mattered to Mephibosheth. That's a man of God. A man of God can let everything else go when it comes in competition. Isn't, isn't this what our Lord says? That if we love father, mother, sister, brother, yea, even our own life more than him, we cannot be his disciple. No man can come after me and follow me, says Jesus, in that case. So when we look upon the earthly things as the greatest of all things, as the things, then it is that our earthly mindedness is sinful. So it's a good question to ask ourselves. What do you consider to be your most prized possession? What's a non-negotiable for you? What do you believe you cannot lose, cannot live without? What would you be devastated to lose? We think first of our families, our spouses, our children, our parents, whatever it may be. But how often do we think of earthly things as well? Something so precious, so dear, so costly to us. And came to us at a great cost, and we can't bear to lose it. Well, an earthly-minded man, that's his greatest possessions. His estate, his honors, his reputation, his riches. An earthly-minded man can't live without these. That's a sinful earthly-mindedness. Secondly, when the best of our thoughts is busy with, our, with earthly things. I mentioned this morning Psalm 4, and I was wrong. It's Psalm 4, 6 is the verse where we read that those, the men of earth, go throughout the earth crying out, who will show us some good? Psalm 4, verse 6. Who will show us some good? When the best of our thoughts are busy with earthly things, it's an earthly mindedness that is sinful. Because what are the thoughts? The thoughts are, the old word is, the effervescence, the bubbling up, right? Think of a carbonated drink, a soda or something, right? It's the effervescence, the bubbling up of the heart. The thoughts are the effervescence of the heart's affections. The things we love bubble up in the mind. The things we love are the things we think about. In fact, our words and our actions, our words and our actions are nowhere near as good an indicator of what's really going on in our heart as our thoughts are. Because the thoughts directly arise from the heart. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it this way. Think of how often a man, think of how often you yourself Think of how often a man may keep his words and actions in check out of respect for company. Say the right thing and do the right thing because you're in the presence of so-and-so. Because of such and such. How easily and how quickly and almost unconscionably do we keep our words and actions in check out of respect or fear or of someone in our, in our presence. So we can't then look to our words and actions as the best indicator of what's really in our heart. But if you look at a man's mind, if you see a man's thoughts, you know immediately what's in his heart. Because there's no reason, you see, to keep the thoughts in check. We can think about whatever we want to think about in the presence of whomever and whatever because they can't know our thoughts. Our thoughts are private to us. That is between us and God, of course, us and our conscience. But and so we have no problem just letting our thoughts run. We have no problem with the bubbling up of our affections in our mind and dwelling and thinking about things because nobody can see what we're thinking about. And we can put a smile on our face and have thoughts of anger. And no man will know. We know what we're really thinking. We know what we really feel besides what we're saying. And so the same is true, not just for others, but of course for all of us. If you want to know where your heart is at, on a particular matter or with regard to a particular person or a particular situation, don't judge your heart directly by your actions and words, especially in the presence of others. Ask yourself what you think about. What's going on in the inner chambers of your mind? Not those random thoughts that spring up once in a while, nor those random thoughts where Satan interjects even blasphemous thoughts sometimes and terrible thoughts. But what are those thoughts that are sweet to you? What are those thoughts that you take pleasure and delight and contentment in? That's what's in your heart. That's what's going on in your heart toward that person, that situation, that circumstance. Through our weakness <coughs> and through Satan's temptations, our minds can often wander off 
into some pretty nasty places. But what do we think about when we're alone? What sort of thinking do we delight in? An unclean person will nurse unclean earthly thoughts. But a child of God, as we saw in Psalm 1 this morning, should meditate on the law of God day and night. That should be our thinking. Which is why Paul tells us to think on those things that are pure and just and holy and etc. And now can you see why Paul says it's so important as a man of God to take every thought captive? You can't let your mind wander. You can't just let your mind go because you can't let your heart go. We're called to give our heart to the Lord, called to pray for the Lord to search our hearts and reveal any sin in us so that we can repent of it. And we're called to set our affections on things above that will directly encourage the right thoughts. All of this, you see, is intertwined. Thirdly, when is earthly mindedness sinful? When our whole heart clings to the earth. When a man's mind clings to the earth and is earthly, you can't take him off of it. You can tell him how vain it is and how empty the things of earth are. You can tell him how harmful the things of earth are to his soul, how dangerous to his eternal welfare, how the things of earth and the things of this world will rob him of real and lasting joy and peace, and still he will not be moved. His heart is fixed. His mind is set. Look at Judges 4, 14. This is exactly what happened in the case of Samson. He would not be moved. Judges 14, verses 1 to 3. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson would not be put off. He would not be deterred. His mind was set. His decision was made. He clung to the thing which he had chosen to love, and he could not be put off. Earthly mindedness, when it's found like that in God's people, it's sinful. Fourthly, when our hearts are filled with distracting cares about the things of the earth, turn back to Matthew chapter 6 and hear our Lord's words in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When our hearts are filled with distracting cares about the things of the earth, it's sinful. There are two things that cause distracting cares about earthly things. First of all, the fear that we'll be deprived of what we hold to be good and our inability to get by without it. We think such things as, what if I lose this? What will I do without it? And so we're distracted because our hearts are so fixed upon that thing, that possession, that substance, whatever it may be. And we're like, what am I going to do if I lose this? How will I get along without it? We count the things of the, when we count the things of the earth as the great things, and we feel like we can't live without them. We feel like if we lose them, we're going to be undone. 
I won't make it without that. I can't go on without that. It's an insufferable hardship to be deprived of the things of the earth. And they think, and they say, well, the promise of God, God will supply your needs, even as Christ tells us here. But when our minds are set on the things of earth, the promises of God are the least help to us. In fact, we think there's no worse condition a man could be in than to have nothing but a promise of God to rely upon. What good is that, we say, when we're minding the earth? That doesn't help me at all. I need this and that and the other. But how differently do we get by when we mind earthly things, or excuse me, heavenly things, which is what Christ tells us here. Your Father knows you need these things. Don't worry about these things. Don't be anxious for these things. God already knows. Seek first his kingdom. He'll take care of these things. How differently do we respond in these situations? We may lose our estate. We may make a bad investment and lose much of our wealth. The Sabians and the Chaldeans may come and take away all our possessions and leave us with nothing. But we won't be undone. We'll be hurt. We will cry. We'll be in pain. We'll be suffering loss. It's not like it doesn't happen or we're stoic about it all. But we won't be undone and our happiness won't be gone. Because we have God. As we heard this morning in the catechism, God is our chief joy. So that when all our comforts are gone, we still have our happiness because God is our chief joy. An earthly man, you see, has his portion in this life. So when he loses that portion, he has nothing. But a heavenly man, his portion is God. His portion is in heaven, Psalm 73. So that though he may lose the things of the earth, and one day they must all be given up anyway, especially at death, A godly man has his treasure in heaven where neither thief nor moth nor rust can destroy. He's going to be okay. He may cry, he may hurt, he may suffer a great loss, but he's going to be okay. Because God is his portion. God is his life. God is his happiness. The other thing that distracts the earthly-minded men is... Not only the anticipation of maybe losing the things of life, but the uncertainty of having anything to prevent that evil. Not only am I afraid to lose what I have, but I have no way to prevent the loss of it. I have no way to prevent it being taken from me. In other words, I have no way to secure this possession or the things of earth so that they remain inescapably and unavoidably mine. But what happens to a heavenly-minded man? He sees his outward means... And he looks on his outward means, and he knows that his outward means are uncertain. We may lose everything tomorrow. We may be bankrupt tomorrow. We may lose our jobs tomorrow. The economy may crash tomorrow. The stock market may crash tomorrow. Anything could happen to all of our outward means. We could, in a day, lose absolutely everything. Job did. So could we. Many have. But in that case, again, we still have the most important. We have a promise of God to trust in. For example, the words of our Lord in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that what he said to Joshua? Don't be afraid when he was going into the land to take possession and fight these armies much greater and bigger and mightier than Israel ever would be. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that promise, because it's a promise of our God, that is a certain means to trust him. That is a solid ground to build upon. And so the godly man, the heavenly man, avoids anxiety He avoids fear, Matthew 6. Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Trust God, seek him first. Our earthly mindedness is also sinful when the great business of our hearts and endeavors are about the things of the earth. What I mean by this is earthly minded men are like children with their games. Think of children and how they play games. We see our children play games, and what they pour their whole selves into it. When children get involved in a game, they pour their whole selves into it as if there is nothing else and as if they have nothing else that matters to them. They don't need to reserve anything. They can pour, they can exhaust themselves in their game, and they throw themselves into this game. They absolutely throw themselves away in it, and they give themselves. In other words, the game consumes them so completely. They think of nothing else. They need not reserve strength for anything else. Reserve time for anything else. This is all there is. This is all that matters. This is all I care about and want to do. An earthly-minded man is like that. He loves and he uses the earth. 
as if the things of the earth match his heart and spirit. In other words, the things of earth consume him and they take up his whole self. He has nothing left. He holds nothing back because nothing else requires his attention. Nothing else is worthy of his attention and devotion and dedication and time and energy but the things of earth. Well, but a heavenly-minded man, what's the difference here? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Heavenly-minded man will give himself to the things of the earth, again, with those subordinate ends and aims. But according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.31, a heavenly-minded man, he uses the things of the earth as if he used them not. It's a very interesting passage, and the context helps us understand what he's saying. We use the things of the earth and the things of the world, he says in that context. We use the things of the world as if we use them not. Because they're not equal to our desires. They don't match our deepest longings. They're necessary. It's necessary to go to work. It's necessary to provide for these things. It's necessary to pursue these things. And many things aren't necessarily necessary, but also good and helpful in life and these are all fine, but these things don't equal and match our desires. We have much stronger spiritual desires that we reserve for higher things, for God. There's a place in our heart, there's a, deep, there's a depth in our soul that the things of earth can never reach. And we reserve that better part, if you will, for the Lord. And so a gracious soul... A godly man, a heavenly-minded man, he follows his business, he provides for his family, he enjoys earth's good comforts, all good and well. But he does so as one who must engage with God in prayer at the end of the day and as one who must stand before God in judgment at the end of life. In other words, there's a chief end over all these subordinate ends. He minds the things of the earth as he must but all in subordination to the things of God and his ultimate and chief end. Think of it this way. An earthly-minded man will do some things that are spiritual. Of course he will. But because his heart isn't in them, he does them as if he didn't do them. And a heavenly-minded man will do some things that are earthly. Again, subordinate ends. But because his heart isn't in them, but his heart is in God... He does them as if he didn't do them. Let's look at two passages that help us get this. Turn to Ezekiel 33. <coughs> Ezekiel 33. Look at verses 30 to 31. <coughs> so you'll see, you'll see an earthly-minded man in the house of God minding the things of God. You'll see a heavenly-minded man out in the world minding the things of the earth. How are they different? It's here. Look at verses 30 to 31 of Ezekiel 33. As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Let's go listen to the prophet and see what he has to say. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people. And they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. You are like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. Their heart is set on their gain. So here we have earthly minded men doing spiritual things. But when an earthly minded man does spiritual things, he did them as if he didn't do them. They won't do what, the, what you say. They'll listen, but they won't do it because their heart is elsewhere. Their, mind are, their minds are set upon the things of the earth and they will, come what may, they will pursue the things of the earth no matter what. Look over in a heavenly minded man. Turn to Colossians 3. Heavenly minded man will give his attention. He will mind the things of the earth as he must. But because his heart isn't in them in the same way that an earthly minded man is, but instead in God, he will do the things of the earth as if he didn't do them. Look at this passage in Colossians, Colossians 3 22 to 24. Bond servants, 
Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service, as an earthly-minded man will, because he wants something out of his boss, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, verse 23, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Notice, you are serving the Lord Christ. So you see the difference. You have an earthly or heavenly-minded man who will give himself to the things of the earth. He must. He has a master to please. He has a, a wage to earn, a family to provide for. He has a job and a career and studies and all these things. He gives himself to the things of the earth as he must. But he does them as if he didn't do them. Because his heart's not in them. He's not seeking to please man for man's sake, for his own sake. He's not a people pleaser. I'm doing it by way of eye service. His mind is on his chief end. His heart is on his God. And he's serving his master as if he didn't serve him because he's really serving God above his master. That's what Paul says. You're not serving your master. You're serving Christ. And that changes the conduct of the spiritual man in an earthly context. Just as the earthly man's heart changes his, context, his conduct in a spiritual context. He may go through the motions and look like everyone else and walk the walk and talk the talk. But he does spiritual things in an earthly way. Always. But a godly-minded man, a heavenly-minded man, does earthly things in a spiritual way as unto the Lord. It's a beautiful picture if you think that through. And it's really helpful to understand what we're talking about. Just a couple more here. Earthly mindedness is sinful when we seek any earthly thing for itself and not in subordination to some greater end. And that's just the Sunday school lesson this morning, isn't it? Again, when heavenly minded men seek the things of the earth, whether business or study, it's done with an eye to being faithful in his family and generation for the Lord's sake. He's doing it as unto the Lord. He seeks those things out of obedience to God. His earthly pursuits are spiritual in their aim and end. Whatever he does on earth, to whatever he gives himself to, it has a spiritual aim and end because he's seeking God's glory and he's trying to be faithful in his generation as a servant of the king, a member of the church, a child of God, a brother or sister in Christ. But an earthly-minded man, he seeks his business for the sake of the success, for the sake of the riches, for the sake of his advancement and his comforts and all the pleasures of flesh. He has earthly aims and earthly goals. He never raises his eyes up. It's always about this life and what I can get out of it, making the most of it, making the best of it, doing what needs to be done for me. He's not seeking the Lord's glory in any of it. And so any good or spiritual thing he does is done in subordination to these earthly desires and goals. So again, an earthly-minded man is earthly in all that he does, while a spiritual-minded man is spiritual in all that he does. And the spiritual-minded man is the heavenly minded man. Next, earthly mindedness is sinful when we are earthly and spiritual things. And this is a bit of an overlap. But what this recognizes is that the best of saints have some earthly mindedness in them and in their spiritual duties. We can't avoid that, unfortunately, because of this body of death. But the difference is the earthly minded man is dominated by earthly desires and aims and ends. That's all he thinks about. We may have a mix, and we struggle with that, and we cry out, Oh, Lord, set my mind, lift my heart, free me from bondage, free me from earthly mindedness. Lord, set my affection. We cry out to God for help in this area because we realize we, we feel and we sense our earthly mindedness at times, and it gets the better of us once in a while, maybe more often than we like. But the reality is we're not content with that. We know better, and we want better. We want to be more heavenly minded. We want to have our thoughts and our hearts set upon things above. We want to live and conduct ourselves in life as one who is a citizen of heaven. Earthly mindedness is also sinful when the difficulties of earthly mindedness are as nothing to us. This is really helpful. Think of, the, think of what people go through to get what they want <laughs> at great cost to themselves. We know our own course. We each, I think, can remember our own course running headlong like a horse into battle in the ways of sin. Absolutely determined. Come hell or high water, I'm getting what I want. And I'm going to do what I want to do. 
An earthly-minded man braves a great many difficulties and toil in getting the things of the earth. But isn't it interesting that he never, never wearies of it because he loves what he does and he's in love with what he seeks. He never gets tired. The Lord rebukes Israel for this. He calls them out on this, right? Unweary, they run headlong into idolatry and headlong into the stubbornness of their ways. And they never seem to tire. We all know what that's like, again, in our own pursuit of sin. Just as the fish never tires of swimming, because water is its proper element, an earthly man never tires of running after the things of the earth. He'll brave the weather. He'll cut short his sleep. He'll get up all crazy hours of the morning to be about his work, pursue his ends. He'll travel wide and far. He'll spend all of his money. He'll suffer many a hazard, all without complaint in the pursuits of the world. Now, he may complain once in a while, of course, but what are you going to do? It's just the way it is, right? You complain, you don't, you don't get what you're, what you're after. So stop complaining and get with it. And that's what an earthly-minded man does. He may complain once in a while, but in the end, he's just going to keep doing what he's doing. He's going to keep chasing the dream. He's going to keep pursuing this world. He never seems to tire. But bring him to church. <laughs> bring an earthly-minded man to church. And the service is way too early on a Sunday morning. The sermon is too long. The Bible is boring. The songs put you to sleep. The people are fake. In the matters of the earth, he can work like a horse and never run out of breath. But every molehill is a mountain in spiritual things. Turn to Malachi chapter 1, and then we'll turn back to Amos. Malachi 1. The Lord has many rebukes of his people in Malachi. It's a really, really amazing uh, book of Scripture. There's several, where the, several places where the Lord says, but you say, and here's one of them, verse 13. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. What a weariness is it, it is to have to go through my flock and give God the best. And you snort at it. And you give me the lame and the sick. What you have no use for. What you're going to kill anyway. What's useless anyway. What you can't sell anyway. That's what you're going to give to God. I am a great king, the great king, and I will be honored among the nations. Surely I should be honored among my own people. That's what the Lord is saying when he rebukes them. What a weariness it is to give God my best, because to give God my best means I can't have it. And that's a weary thing. The Lord rebukes his people. Turn over to Amos chapter 8, verse 5. God again rebukes his people. Verse, beginning in verse 4 of Amos chapter 8. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale? That we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances? That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat? What hypocrisy. They would not use unjust measures on the Sabbath, but they would use unjust measures on the other six days of the week. So the problem they found with the Sabbath is, in good conscience, quote-unquote, they couldn't rob people as they did every other day of the week. What a weariness it is that I have, to, I have to judge justly on the Sabbath, that I have to sell righteously on the Sabbath, that I have to deal righteously with my neighbor. I can't cheat. I can't steal. I can't sell the chaff of the wheat and bury all the chaff underneath the kernels. Because I want to honor the Lord. That would be wrong. I can do that the other six days and on the Sabbath. And God rebukes Israel for this. This is an earthly-minded man. All he can think of is the things of the earth. Bring an earthly-minded man into the things of God. Bring him into a spiritual context. And it's weary for him. But in the world, he never grows tired of pursuing the things of life. He will die for these things. 
To a heavenly-minded man, of course, the Sabbath is a delight. The Sabbath is the forerunner of his heart's eternal joy in the kingdom of heaven. He finds the Sabbath to be a day of pleasure. He goes through its spiritual duties with ease because he has a mind to do it. You remember the, the people building the wall in Nehemiah, how they built the wall so quickly? Nehemiah says because they had a mind to work. And it came easy to them, each man to build his own section. And so it is for a, a heavenly-minded man. When he comes into the things of God, it's his proper element. It's like the fish that never tires of swimming. It doesn't mean there's not a struggle with the earthly-mindedness that we have in our hearts and the old man within, sin within. Of course there's that struggle. It's not that it's completely easy and there's no difficulty at all into to coming into the house of God and sitting under the word and using the means of grace. There is difficulty. But we fight against that difficulty. What we, what we, the, the problem we have is not with the things of God, but with our own backwardness toward it. That's the problem. The earthly-minded man has a problem with the things of God. Our problem is with ourselves. What a drastic difference. We love the things of God. We hate that we're so backward to it. We hate that we can't pray. We hate that we're distracted. We hate that we can't focus. We hate that our minds wander and our hearts get tied up with our affections on other things when we should be minding the things of God. Our problem is within, and we know that, and we cry out to God, who shall, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's the heavenly-minded man. The earthly-minded man, oh, what a weariness this religion stuff is, this Christian stuff is, this church stuff is. What a weariness this is. That's a sinful earthly-mindedness. And then finally, earthly-mindedness is sinful when we think of the spiritual truths of Scripture in an earthly way. For instance, an earthly-minded man, he will think of God and he will think of heaven. But he will think of God in terms of what I can get out of him. And he will think of heaven as a place that finally I will be free of pain, free of suffering, and I will be free of trouble. In other words, it's all about me. Now, an earthly-minded man will find no business in heaven. But if he were to think about heaven and as he dwells among the people of God, this is what he thinks about heaven. I can't wait. I can't wait for such a life of ease. But a heavenly-minded man, he thinks of God for himself. He think of, thinks of heaven as a place where his heart will finally enjoy the full, unhindered fellowship of the triune God. He thinks of spiritual things in a spiritual way as they relate to the things of God and my love for God and my chief end, God's glory. An earthly-minded man, if he ever thinks of spiritual things, it's in an earthly way. What's in it for me? Right? I go to church for these reasons. I dwell among the people of God for these reasons. I live moral for these reasons. All about me. For a heavenly-minded man, it's really simple. I love Jesus Christ, and he set me free. My eyes set upon God, and I want to dwell and live with God forever. It's very different. So we have two very different men. Lives determined by minds. Conduct determined by thinking. An earthly-minded man will give way to earthly living. Paul tells, him, tells us in Philippians 3, beware, beware and do of these men. Do not imitate those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, for their end is destruction, their, their belly is their God, and they glory in their shame, who have minds set on earthly things. But our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we await the Lord Jesus Christ. Two very different people whose lives will, will be the translation of those thoughts. So here we see what earthly mindedness is. And it's a help to have it laid before us in its nature and in its characteristics. So just some questions to think about as we close out this evening. How do our hearts compare with these marks? Right? Any truth has to be brought home to the heart. It can't be left in a book. It can't be left on the page. How do our hearts compare with these marks? The truth to tell, we all have some earthly mindedness. The best of saints, as we've already said, has some earthly mindedness in him. So what we need to do is, number one, not ignore it. Number two, not deny it. Number three, find it and deal with it. How do we grow in heavenly mindedness? How do we more and more grow to set our minds on things above and not on the things of earth? As Paul says in Colossians 3. And so where do we find earthly mindedness in our lives? We've got to go from what we think about to how it's affected the way we live. Where do we find an earthly mindedness? How has it gotten so a hold of us 
but it's actually affected the way we conduct ourselves, that we're living in some ways as if we were made for earth, and this is all there is, as if we were men of the world rather than men of heaven. We need to find that and repent of it. Number three, can we see how earthly mindedness pollutes our spiritual duties? Can we not identify how earthly mindedness affects our Bible reading, our prayer closets, our Lord's Day? We need to begin pinpoint where earthly mindedness has brought us to the place and affected us and polluted us in such a way that we, we have gotten to think that the things of God are a weariness, that they're difficult. And what we're complaining about is not ourselves, but God and what he requires of us. If that's where we're at, then we need to backtrack and find out where it began. But we need to identify where it's polluted our spiritual duties. Because the Lord looks at the heart, remember. And by looking at the heart, God looks at the mind. They're so intertwined, right? God knows our thoughts. He knows what we think of him. God says in scripture several times to his people, I know what you're thinking. So when we come to our spiritual duties, we can do them as well as anybody. We can do them better than others. But it matters not a bit if our hearts and minds are set upon things below. Again, Colossians 3. Set your minds on things above. So we need to see where it's polluted our spiritual duties because God looks to the heart. Fourthly, this is a good place to ask ourselves, what do we think of earthly mindedness in itself? We've talked about earthly mindedness. We've laid out several marks of it as far as its nature. Do we think it's a small sin? Do we think it's a small matter? Or do we think it's a great matter? Do we think it's as bad or worse than the gross sins of the second table of the law, murder and adultery and etc.? Is earthly mindedness that bad? Is earthly mindedness as bad as idolatry or blasphemy? Is it that bad? Take some time and think about where you think earthly mindedness falls. How bad is it? It obviously gives way to some pretty bad things. and But is it bad? Or is it just a small matter to address? Or is it a great matter that needs our attention? Give that some thought. Because in the end, this is the question we have to ask. What does God say about earthly mindedness? Because it matters not what we think about it. We're not a good judge of it. <laughs> because we're biased. What does God say about earthly mindedness? I would challenge you over this next week to think about that and to wrestle with Scripture, reflect upon the word that you've read, the word you know, Scriptures you've memorized. Think about what God says of earthly mindedness. What's his opinion of the matter? Because that's where we need to begin, and that's the place from which we need to go. What does the Lord say about it? That's the only right view on the matter. And until we see what earthly mindedness is to the Lord, then we'll never truly value the opposite, the necessity and the benefit and the blessing of heavenly mindedness. Right? We don't let go of one unless we see the value of actually holding on to the other instead. And we certainly can't have both. So the God, scripture has to bring us to a place where we see things as God sees them, as far as the things of the earth go. And then we'll value the things of God and the things of heaven, the spiritual things, as God does. And we'll seek them at all costs because we'll see what great value they are. Amen.